So hello and welcome to Ontology Talk. Uh, today we're honored to have Dr. Richard Waldinger as our guest. Uh, Richard is a principal scientist in the AI Center at Stanford Research Institute, which is now known just by its acronym SRI, uh, where he's worked since 1969. Welcome, Richard. Oh, good to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. Uh, we're, really... th we're there, depending on how we look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all have this space problem nowadays yeah. with video calls. <laughs> It's all virtual. So I, I wanted to get started um, just really centering on uh, theorem proving. And you've been involved in theorem proving and many other approaches to symbolic AI for, for I think, 50 years now. Um, how is this work most relevant to both science and application today? Uh, the theorem proving is one approach to uh, artificial intelligence in that uh, a machine that can do symbolic reasoning can solve real world problems if we can uh, encode those problems in a symbolic or logical form. And uh, a lot of things I've been doing have been trying to apply theorem proving to uh, problems like uh, automatic programming and planning and question answering, which uh, are you know genuine real uh, real life uh, problems? The, the problem comes in in that something that people find intuitively uh, straightforward and uh, easy can uh, become much more difficult when you encode them in a symbolic form because it involves uh, uh, formalization, phrasing you know, intuitive ideas in. Uh, a representation and the representation may be uh, quite a bit larger than we expect and uh, uh, not so easy to understand for for people and uh, also sometimes not so easy to uh, prove the theorems that you need to prove to be able to solve the problems right people have all this ability uh, to read between the lines. And when we say brief things, we take into account all sorts of context and background that helps us uh, understand what other people say, but uh, computers don't have this ability, obviously. So it makes things a challenge. Right, even something like natural language understanding, which five-year-olds do very well, uh, still our computers are no match for a five-year-old in terms of uh, uh, what they can actually uh, understand and, uh, and do effectively. Yeah, although in a way it seems to me that uh, one of the actual benefits of this work though is uh, uh, requiring a certain discipline of forcing people to spell things out. I mean, we take it for granted that we can tell each other things uh, very easily and uh, you and I can figure things out. Um, but then uh, for uh, recording our ideas, for capturing ideas, um, it's easy to forget that the machines don't understand these things. So uh, symbolic reasoning is great for the way that it sort of forces us to be really explicit. We can, we can understand what we do much better when we explain it to a machine because we have to spell out all the details that we didn't realize had to be spelled out uh, before. Yeah, it's kind of the same way when I get stuck uh, programming and uh, it, the best way for me to figure out what's wrong is to try to explain my problem to er somebody else. And usually before I'm done, I've already solved the problem. It's just like if you tried to tell someone how to ride a bicycle, someone who's never done it before, uh, you probably don't have a chance to uh, say everything that they need to know and they probably wouldn't be able to understand it uh, well enough to uh, actually do it. You know. It, it, it's not something you can, it, it's very hard to formalize something that people can do uh, quite easily once they learn how. Yeah, and it's great that you mentioned uh, riding a bicycle because that is a sort of a really good example of something that's sort of intuitive and physical and sensory uh, that people do very easily. Uh, and it was the sort of thing that a long time ago people tried to do through symbolic approaches, but now really have settled on uh, machine learning is to way, a way to do this. Um, so mm -hmm. what do you think are kind of the, the, how would you describe the main differences between the symbolic approaches that you've been most chiefly involved with and the, what we might call modern AI, which has really uh, just been concentrating primarily on statistical machine learning. How are these technologies different and how are their application areas different? Uh, so statistical machine learning, it could be 
regarded as looking at lots of examples and trying to uh, copy those examples. And if you have a large enough examples, you could find the uh, you can find the appropriate thing to do in uh, most situations that show up. But you might not be uh, uh, understanding of in in a re uh, the sense we really mean it. You might really not really be understanding what you're doing. Like like someone who goes to lots of cocktail parties might pick up lots of uh, jokes and they could then they could then uh, play back at the uh, at the next cocktail party and uh, people would think oh they're they're pretty funny or pretty smart. Uh, but actually they're just uh, parroting what they've heard uh, previously and they might not be. Uh, uh, they may not be uh, so good at uh, facing something that hasn't been covered in a previous cocktail party. Uh, even politicians who uh, can be uh, very glib when when uh, answering questions that they've already uh, been uh, been coached on, but uh, uh, might stumble when they uh, get uh, a tough question that they haven't seen before. Yeah, the last thing we need is a computer with all the problems that a, a glib politician has and none of the benefits. <laughs> right, yes. Yeah, so, so this is really good. I mean, it's, I think it uh, explains well um, why there's sort of these different uh, application areas. So we saw with uh, there was this uh, thing that Microsoft did a while back, Tay AI, which, as you said, uh, kind of learned to parrot back things. And unfortunately, some pranksters uh, and people with some poor motives uh, taught it some like, you know, like a, a, a sort of a bad cousin teaching your uh, child the naughty words. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the machine just learned to parrot back all of this stuff and they had to shut down the program. So this kind of explains like one of the challenges of machine learning. It, it learns everything, whether you want it to or not. Mm -hmm. But I think I, even so, I think it's very impressive that uh, these systems have learned how to play go to uh, to a uh, uh, international grandmaster level just by watching watching uh, people's uh, people other people play or playing playing with itself and uh, although this is uh, said to be a new it's regarded as a new thing but actually it's an approach that uh, has been tried since since the 1950s and only recently is uh, uh, gotten gotten to be uh, effective like uh, Arthur Samuel's checker playing program uh, uh, I think it knew the rules of checkers, but didn't have any uh, strategy. It only it learned everything by uh, looking at uh, games that other people have played and playing itself. And the more it played itself, the better and better it got until it uh, got to be a formidable uh, opponent. And even I think I think it uh, never beat the world champion, but uh, he either retired or died before before the the. Uh, system was uh, before the match was uh, uh, held, but uh, I think it, he uh, regarded it as a formidable opponent, and it, it, uh, no one had ever taught it any checker checker uh, strategy. It just learned it all by itself. Well, that is impressive. I had I had forgotten about that uh, that mm -hmm. uh, past project. When what uh, time period was that? And your I think it was like 1958, because I, I, wow. I, I I remember it as being and it was on IBM 704, which was like a a much, much slower and smaller machine than we have available now. And uh, I don't think that uh, uh, chess playing programs were, were that good at that time, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, the approach was good for checkers and, uh, and certainly now for things like face recognition and uh, uh, mechanical skills, it certainly seems appropriate, but people are now assuming that that approach will be able to do everything and uh, I think there's some problems that it's appropriate for and some problems that it's uh, gonna stumble on. Yeah, I, I certainly always worry about uh, overfitting, which seems to not be mentioned very much. And yet, uh, whenever a researcher does a sort of adversarial thing, like there, I think there are some researchers at University of Wyoming a number of years ago that uh, showed how uh, you know things that look like TV test patterns could be mistaken as cats and so forth because right. they, they were able to train their adversarial network to find uh, exactly the cases where that that would fool the AI system because it had no real mm -hmm. knowledge about the real world. It just picked up on whatever was the statistically best determiner for the classification that was asked to find. 
it's just like I, I think in the in the 70s or 80s uh, uh, there were systems for expert systems for medical diagnosis and John McCarthy uh, proposed a problem where a man was pregnant and presented it to the system and it had never had never uh, uh, been told that uh, men don't get pregnant and didn't, and didn't think anything. You know, it, it tried to do a diagnosis, but didn't uh, question the fact that uh, how, did, how did a man get pregnant? Yeah, so, I, so I've often thought that uh, we really should be combining multiple modes of intelligence. And uh, certainly John McCarthy, uh, well, not only John McCarthy, but also Marvin Minsky, um, in, in uh, his Society of the Mind book, uh, I, I think really had a lot of great examples of this, that intelligence isn't just one thing, and that if we have a diversity of approaches, we're likely to get to real intelligent behavior faster. Yeah, there was just uh, an article about, who was it, Howard Gardner, a Harvard psychologist who uh, has a, a proposal that we actually uh, consider eight different forms of intelligence, which are uh, uh, sort of orthogonal. So you could be intelligent in, in any one of them without being intelligent in any of the others. And uh, uh, you, know, you could be a, a, a very good, very good uh, logician or do mathematics, but not have, uh, not have good verbal ability or uh, language skills. Right. I mean, we're all familiar with these uh, sensational stories of, you know, somebody who can calculate pi to 500 digits, but has trouble taking care of his or her uh, basic needs. Um, so okay. clearly there's some, some different things going on in the human brain that we don't fully understand yet. Yeah, yeah, that's a, an extreme case, but uh, it's all, always interesting. Yeah. So do you have, have you done any work recently in uh, or with colleagues on combining AI, uh, you know, conventional uh, symbolic AI with m more modern statistical AI approaches? Well, uh, not very much. I've been mostly working on the symbolic stuff, but I, I have used uh, a mechanism called procedural attachment, where you're uh, you're uh, working on a problem using a symbolic approach, and then then you find that some some problem is really more appropriate to some external approach, which could be which could be uh, statistical, or uh, it could be looking something up in a big table, or uh, it could be a it could be running a program like. Well, for example, in doing arithmetic, like in a, a, a symbolic approach, might uh, try to uh, uh, use reasoning to solve arithmetic. But there uh, are actually programs which do arithmetic very quickly. So if you happen to uh, reduce your problem to doing some arithmetical computation, you should just send it off to a program which does the computation, let it you know, let the program finish and come back in with the answer. And then you can continue your symbolic reasoning uh, uh, without uh, having to worry about uh, encoding all this arithmetic in, in, uh, as, a logic, as logical reasoning, which is, which is much more cumbersome. Yeah, I could imagine this being uh, com the combining uh, a reasoning system that needs to reason about, say, you know, who in the office is here today? Uh, who could I get to help with uh, this particular engineering problem? And maybe it doesn't have complete information, but it has access to a vision system that can do face recognition and find out, oh, Richard's in the office today. And you don't want your theorem prover to sort of figure out that from, from uh, image recognition. It can't do that. Um, but uh, you could have a machine learning based face recognition system that could pull a fact about the world like Richard is in the office today and, and then make good use of that in a reasoning problem to say, find the person with the right expertise who can give me some help. Right. Like uh, Whitehead and Russell, when they wrote the Principia Mathematica, which was a, a, a pure logical uh, presentation, it took them some 50 or 100 pages before they could prove that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now, you wouldn't want to have to go through all that to uh, uh, when, you, when you're asked whether 2 plus 2 equals 4, you just want to... Uh, want to compute it. And there, there are some things we know how to compute very well and some things we don't know that much about. And I think reasoning is uh, uh, more for the stuff which is uh, not well not well understood yet. Yeah, uh, there's, uh, I think, a, a, a challenge that many of us face in that if we understand one approach or one tool very well, we try to apply it to everything. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, 
using the right tool for the job to solve the right problem is, is certainly an important skill, as important as knowing of, uh, how to use individual tools themselves. Certainly was something that plagued early AI, uh, where we had people doing symbolic approaches to things which are sensory and they didn't work. And so, so there was this uh, growth of a new method, machine learning to handle those. But now I think there's the, maybe the opposite problem that everybody that's really deep into machine learning and sees it as the answer to everything has kind of forgotten about some of the symbolic approaches, including things that you're working on and they're improving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think like I've been working on uh, automatic programming problems and programming is the sort of thing which you really do want to do precise reasoning. Uh, and most attempts to use machine learning to do uh, programming have, uh, they can construct programs by looking at other programs that do similar things, but uh, there's no, uh, uh, there's a high likelihood that the program will actually be, have bugs in it. You know, it, it, the program that they're copying work for something, but not for the, not for the new problem. So they uh, don't, don't really understand what the program is supposed to be doing. They're just copying old programs. Which works yeah. to an extent. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like something that would be most appropriate for uh, giving hints, like having a, an assistant that doesn't really understand what you're doing, saying, oh, hey, I remember, you know, when uh, three years ago you were working on a problem that looked kind of like this one, and here's some code. Would this be helpful? Yeah, that, it, it, it's pretty, uh, pretty much like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> well, when I uh, first started out, I, I, I was uh, tempted to use a statistical approach and I looked at uh, the literature and there was a, uh, uh, I think it, it might've been from the fifties or early sixties uh, at IBM, someone who had used a statistical approach to generate programs and found that it did worse than chance. In other words, they could have, uh, they could have done a, a purely random generating programs and done better than their, than their, uh, uh, statistical approach. So I was, I was sort of warned away from, from doing it. And that was the, the common wisdom uh, around the time when I was uh, starting work was that, well, they had tried statistical approaches and, and it hadn't worked out. So, uh, uh, so I went off to uh, other, other approaches, but uh, maybe if I, you know, maybe if I'd stayed with statistical approach, computers would have gotten fast enough and big enough to eventually uh, uh, do good things as they are doing now. Well, maybe the, the lesson to learn from this is, you know, be very wary when somebody tells you, oh, we tried that and it didn't work. Yeah. That, uh, you know, that, it, it's, it's, it maybe just didn't try hard enough. Or yeah, hard enough or in the right way. I mean, yeah. certainly the, uh, the story is told often of people getting out of machine learning because Marvin Minsky said perceptrons didn't work because they didn't quite get the full depth of what he was saying since he was making a narrow comment and people overgeneralized it. And right. Then, yeah. And then the methods got better and the computers got faster and now it's all very practical. Yeah, there are sort of fads in uh, artificial intelligence where uh, one approach uh, does something good and everyone says, oh, well, this is the way, this is the way to do it and uh, abandon everything else and do, and that certainly happened with logic too. When, uh, uh, when I first started, logic seemed to be the answer to everything and uh, it uh, hasn't turned out that way. Yeah, so maybe maybe one of the things that uh, those of us that have been in the field for a, a while or longer um, can try to impart to others is to have this sense of perspective that the, the dominant approach does change. And so, you know, work on what you're passionate about and think you have an answer for and trying to don't let people discourage you because even if your thing isn't popular now, it may be popular five years from now and that might be a great place to be in. Yeah, yeah, there are fads just like, just like in fashion. Yeah, I remember uh, in say maybe there's the early early 90s reading you know, Rummel Hart and McClellan's books on neural networks mm -hmm. and trying to learn about them. And you know they looked, they looked interesting, but it wasn't really what I got into because nobody else in the lab that I was working in uh, was studying that sort of thing. So I, I kind mm -hmm. of went with symbolic stuff uh, because that's where I could get answers to the questions I had about what should I work on. Mm -hmm. Well, there, I mean, there there are new new ideas in uh, machine learning also that have made it made it more practical. It isn't just it isn't just uh, being faster and uh, bigger. Oh, absolutely, yes, of course. <laughs> we'll pause our conversation there and return in our next video for part two of our conversation with Richard Waldinger.